Testing, testing. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Yep. How are we doing on time? We good? Hey, we're going to go ahead and get started. Since it is 930, we're going to start our Sunday school class. Uh, to all the high schoolers in the class, welcome. I know um, your Sunday school teacher is not here today. I was wondering what you were doing here, Jack. And uh, then it just occurred to me as I was trying to show other people where to go, and I realized I didn't know where to go myself. So um, glad you guys are here. We are continuing on with our Sunday school class entitled, Why We Do What We Do. And I think that's kind of important for a church, right? Because if you don't know why you do what you do, you just go with what you know, or you go with the flow until you come up with a new flow. And what ends up happening is no one, let me put it this way, no one drifts towards holiness. No one just gradually finds themselves winding up in a better spot. Things have a tendency to degrade and downgrade unless we pay special and particular attention. That's what Hebrews tells us, that we must pay much closer attention to the things we have been taught lest we drift away from them. Which is why we're examining the different practices and the novel principles that Grace Church holds that might be different from the world out there, or even some of the churches that you found yourself in in the past. And the goal isn't simply to tell you, hey, here's what we do. It's to tell you, here's biblically why we think this is the way it is, and here's why we do it the way we do it. And we're seeking to apply both wisdom and scripture in such a way that best practices are utilized both in the church, in our homes, and in our personal lives. We're seeking to be a Bible people. One of the greatest compliments I ever heard was Charles Spurgeon speaking of John Bunyan, two of my big heroes of the faith. And Spurgeon says of Bunyan, if you prick him with a needle, he bleeds bibbling. Boy, I hope that can be said of Grace Church. I hope that can be said of your life. I hope that can be said of your family. They, they, if, if, man, if you poke them, Bible just comes out. I, I can say one of the greatest compliments I personally received is I was ministering to another pastor who was going through a difficult time, and, and I came alongside, and I was talking to him, and I was reminding him of what Scripture said and what the promises of God were, and what he said to me was, boy, I always appreciate that when I come to you and Peter, I always get Bible. And it's like, well, what else do we have? That, that's the final foundation, because that's what points us to Jesus. So, so with no further ado, I'm going to pray, and then we'll jump right into preaching for today. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the opportunity I have, the privilege of ministering to your church, to your saints, to your people. And Lord, may I never take that for granted. Forgive us, Lord, when we become flippant with your word and with your worship. When we become callous to the divine and eternal realities that are around us. And Lord, I pray that you would lead our hearts back to you. And I pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, um, let me start with a story real quick. I remember when I first came to Grace Church, a uh, family that's no longer here, um, they, they were doing some work outside their house. And uh, Peter said, it might be good if you went over there and helped them. And I said, absolutely, sure, that'd be great. I get to know these people, I get to talk to these people, and I get there just in time to find out that a couple of their neighbors are coming in, and, and we're, we're helping uh, do some stuff for this gentleman. And as we did so, I started talking to the neighbors as well, and they didn't really know who I was. Uh, and so finally, uh, this gentleman introduced me. This is one of our pastors at Grace Church. He's the associate. He's pretty much new. And the guy goes, that's great, you know, I, I love our priests. I don't prefer our other priests. And I said, really? And he, I said, why is that? And he said, well, because he preaches too long. I said, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> You're all laughing, right? That's, ter- that's, that's just awful. Like, like, how long does he preach? He goes, you believe he actually goes 15 minutes? And I, 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 what do you say to that, right? Like, I, you know, I came from the South where if you preach for less than 35 minutes, you ain't doing your job. They're going to fire you, right? Um, preaching has fallen on hard times today. Pe- people find better things to do. You can watch stuff on TV. You can always hear a better, uh, you know, guide on um, TED Talks, and you can, and the preacher, the stand-up comedian's always going to be able to out or do with jokes, the pastor, uh, the storyteller's always going to be able to tell better stories than the pastor, and so preaching seems to have fallen on hard times, and the world out there looks at this and says, you guys are an anachronism. You're fossils, you're dinosaurs, nobody does this anymore. We don't believe in a sage on the stage anymore, we believe in a guide on the side. And so if we are going to do preaching, you get up here with a stool and you have a little coffee, 
uh, table right here and kind of just lean in, talk to you guys conversantly like this. Tell a lot of jokes, tell a lot of stories. Because, you know, that's what it's all about. Keeping the butts in the pews. Keeping the nickels and noses. Except it's not. That's not what the Bible teaches us. And however the world may feel about preaching, we don't take our cues from the world. We don't take our marching orders from this culture. We take them from Christ. When we take them from his Bible. But the reality is, it's not just the world out there that, in which preaching has fallen on hard times. It's also the church in here. And to illustrate that point, I want to share what I heard from um, a lecture series given called The Art of Preaching by Mark Dever at the, school, the seminary I went to. And he writes, quote, I remember a number of years ago, at one point I was reading biographies of both Albert Schweitzer and Martin Lloyd-Jones at the same time. Now, if you know anything about um, theologians in the mid-20th century, those two are on diametrically opposite sides, right? Albert Schweitzer was a hardcore liberal who I doubt he believed the resurrection actually happened, right? I don't think he would have a problem with me saying that either. On the other side, you have Martin Lloyd-Jones who believed the entire book, including the table of contents. All right, so so completely opposite sides. But they both had very interesting lives that, that fascinated this gentleman. He said, you know, Schweitzer left his theological training, left being a theologian to become a doctor in Africa. To become one day, quote, the doctors that he said, whom, quote, these poor creatures needed. So he seems to have had less faith in words and more faith in deeds. Perhaps his own uncertainty, this is Dever speaking, about his, uh, his, own histor- his own uncertainty about the historical Jesus teachings led him to the concreteness of the good deeds that Jesus undoubtedly commanded. So he's saying, because Schweitzer wasn't sure if the Bible was true, He wasn't sure if Jesus actually existed or if Jesus actually said these things. He drifted more towards, i got to do what I can do because I don't know what Christ can do. And Therefore, he leaves being a theologian and a pastor in order to become a doctor. Schweitzer ended his life as a theologically trained doctor. Lloyd-Jones, on the other hand, who was that great preacher from London, left practicing medicine on Harley Street, to become a preacher in Wales. Now, just to put that in categories for you, Carly Street is a really wealthy street, very affluent area of London. It's the capital of the British Empire at the beginning of the 20th century. It is the heart of, like, he went to Bart's. Like, he, he, um, if you know Sherlock Holmes, you get that one. If, if not, just stay with me. This is where, like, it's like, think Harvard Medicine, right? Or, or whatever the equivalent is, where you have a prestigious law degree from um, Johns Hopkins or, or something like that. He, he had that degree, and then he goes to work on Harley Street, for the, and the guy who's mentoring him, the doctor above him, is the guy who treats none other than the King of England. That's where Lloyd-Jones was. He was an MD, and he gives it up in order to go to Wales, a backwater state within the British Empire, and preach at a very small little church. Now, eventually, he's going to come back to London and preach at a larger church, but he starts there. He said he was tired of stitching people up just to see them go back out to sin. You could say that he had had less faith in human deeds and more in God's word. As Jesus told the tempter, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. His certainty of the limited help of medical help in dealing with the human problems led him to the certainty of the gospel. Lloyd-Jones' life ended as a medically trained preacher. A reporter from London's Evening Standard newspaper column in April 24, 1939, wrote of an interview with Lloyd-Jones, quote, Why did you give up medicine for preaching? He looked at me searchingly and after a second's hesitation replied, Because I became more interested in people than in their diseases. As a doctor said in his own lectures on preaching, quote, I would say without any hesitation that the most urgent need in the Christian church today is true preaching. And that is, it is the greatest and most urgent need in the church. It is obviously the greatest need of the world also. Now, I understand that everybody has a different calling. And and I'm not trying to make light of medicine or of any other vocation. But I want you to hear the heart of Lloyd-Jones. And God used him in mighty and powerful ways up until and after the Second World War. 
It was said because of the, the revival that took place in Wales through the preaching of Martin Lloyd-Jones, that was the only thing that kept Wales from going communist. One, excuse me, one of the two things. There was another historical event I can't remember off the top of my head. But, but the point is, um, people were less likely to be given in to despair or to jealousy or towards giving over to, to ideologies that are unbiblical. Why? Because they had faithful preaching from faithful pastors from a faithful God. Preaching is so important. And you, you, it, I know that's important for me to hear because I'm a pastor and I'm a preacher. But it's also important for you to hear because you need to know when you've heard it. You, know, you need to know what to look for. You need to know who to hire as a next pastor. Lord forbid, if you ever move out of Algona, you've got to figure out what church you're going to. And that boils down in many ways to preaching. But, but I want, let me make my case real quick here. Let's start with this. What should be included in the worship of the church? What should be included? And this is not rhetorical. You, please feel free to t- tell me, give me things. What, what comes to mind when you think of worship in the church? What are core components that have to be there, should be there, need to be there? Prayer, okay. Bible. Music, okay. Gospel, who said that? Attaboy, Greg. What else? Baptism? Fellowship? Fellowship. Communion. Communion? Well, you guys are nailing these. Let's look at a couple of scriptures, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 42, the day of Pentecost, the day that the church is founded in the New Testament after Jesus has ascended into heaven, after he sends his spirit, after the, the apostles and disciples speak in tongues, after pa- Peter preaches his gospel message to the people of Jerusalem. Thousands of people get converted, and what are we told? So those who received the word were baptized. There's baptism. And there were added about 3,000 souls. We, said, we talked about this before, but added to the church. And they devoted themselves, get this, to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So these seem to be things corporately, they, right, plural, devoted themselves to with one another. And what's included? Teaching. The apostles' teaching, right? What else? What's that? Fellowship. Fellowship. Breaking of bread. I would take that as communion, right? Um, Because you have one ordinance at the very beginning. People were baptized. Now you have the breaking of bread, which seems to be code for communion. What else? And the prayers. These are elements that are important, that are essential to Christian worship. This is what Jesus, in his word, teaches us about worship. And it's not just in the New Testament. We see it also in the Old Testament. But let's keep looking at the New Testament just for right now. What else? How about music? Somebody said music. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So is worship, is musical worship, let me say that that way, is musical worship a component of Christian worship? Yes. It's very important that we understand, right? Uh, A lot of times today when we talk about worship, people just think songs. You realize the worship doesn't stop just because this music stops, just because the band stops. The worship keeps going because worship is an attitude of the heart and is recognition of the worthiness of God and adoring and just beholding him for who he is. So now we got music, we got fellowship, we got prayers, we got the apostles teaching, breaking of bread, baptism, why, why do we do all this? Well, let, me, let me go back real quick. One here too. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It would notice that the word of Christ seems to be the junk drawer for everything else that takes place, the teaching, the admonishing, and then the singing. All are the word of Christ. So the subject matter, the criteria, the material that we sing is the words of Christ. Not that it has to be completely and entirely always biblical, Right? We, we don't just limit ourselves, for example, to singing the Psalms, although some churches do. No, no, no. But it is biblical truths, biblical content. The New Testament, we see that the church came up with different songs that they would sing together. There are hymns found throughout the New Testament. Like one from Philippians comes to mind. But the idea is, are you singing biblical truth? So when we talk about the priority of the word, we're not just talking about preaching. We're talking about every component of worship. Right? 
Because in our singing, it's the word, it's, we're singing the word. When we're praying, we're praying the word. When we're preaching, we're preaching the word. When we, when we participate in communion and baptism, we are seeing the word played out. These are like visible words, tangible signs meant to remind you of gospel truth, meant to proclaim to you in just one other medium, one other venue, not just with your ears now, but also with your eyes and with your tongue, with your hands, a truth about the gospel of Jesus. And so we read the word. We sing the word. We pray the word. We see the word played out in baptism and communion. Why? Because a word-driven church is a Christ-centered church. And this is really important. Even the word is not the ultimate goal. Right? The the word is meant to point us beyond itself to the word made flesh. To the God-man. To God's final word. His final revelation in his son Jesus. How do I know? Because Jesus says so. Luke chapter 24. And he said to them, you have the the disciples walking on the way to Emmaus. They know Jesus has been crucified. They know he's been buried. They've heard from some ladies that he's been raised from the grave and they don't believe it. They're not sure what to do with that. So they're walking to Emmaus and on the way, who do they encounter? But Jesus. Except they don't know it's Jesus. So they start talking to Jesus and explaining to Jesus what happened with Jesus and why they're confused about why Jesus died. And here's what Jesus says to them. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses... And all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, if you know anything about uh, Judaism, you understand that they refer to the Old Testament as Tanakh, right? Tanakh is an acronym. So this literally comes from three Hebrew words, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketubim, Tanakh, right? And and in the Tanakh, you start with Torah, which is the words or the law of Moses. And you end with Malachi, Right? And Malachi is what? He's the prophets, right? And the whole point is, Jesus is saying, and Luke, through Jesus, is saying, listen, from Genesis to Malachi, it's all about me. In case you missed it, he says right there, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. It's all about Jesus. You miss Jesus, you miss the point. John 5, 39, Jesus says to the Pharisees who knew their Bibles, who memorized their Bibles, he says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. If you miss me, you've missed the point of the Bible that you've memorized. How do you do that? So a New Testament church is a Christ-centered church, and a Christ-centered church is a word-driven church. Because it's through the word that we behold Christ. It's through the word that we love Christ. That we know Christ. We know what Christ wants from us. Think, think of what we talked about at the very beginning of this class a couple of weeks ago. When we talked about what is the mission of Grace Church. What is our purpose? Our purpose ultimately is to glorify God right there on the wall. For the glory of God and the joy of his people. How do we do that? What are the marching orders Jesus gave to us? Two, two commands. Great command, the great commission. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, how do you love a God you don't know? Better yet, um, how do you love someone that you don't want to know? If you're married and you're trying to share your heart, you're really divulging just just intimate intimate secrets to your spouse and you're you're telling them just the details you've never shared with anybody and in the middle of it, they're like, you know, I've had enough. I appreciate it. But I just, can we just sit here in silence? How's that going to go over? And and what loving spouse would do that? If we truly love God, we have to know the God we love. We have to know how to love. And by the way, the only way we love God is because he first loved us, which means we need to know how he loved us to receive that love. But the second part of our mission is what? The Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Well, 
if we're supposed to teach disciples, we're supposed to be disciples making disciples, we're supposed to tell people about Jesus and all that Jesus taught us, it's kind of on us to know what Jesus teaches. It's on us to know Jesus' commands, to follow those commands. And how do you do that apart from the Bible? How do you do that apart from the Word? So a New Testament church is always a Christ-centered church, and a Christ-centered church is always a Word-driven church. Jesus says so. His Word presumes it, presupposes it. And the apostles agree. What do they say? When, when they get stuck, <laughs> sidetracked with good things, helpful things, nice things, they're ministering to poor people and widows. You can't beat that. You can't argue with that, except in this case, you kind of can. Why? Because it's pulling them away from the primary mission of the church and their primary ministry as apostles and elders. So what do they say? They say, listen, we need to promote deacons who can take this job of ministering to the people who need it. But then we as a church, and we specifically as apostles, need to focus on our primary ministry and mission, which is what? We devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So here's my question. What is the ministry of the word? We know what prayer is. We're not always good at applying it, but we know what prayer is. What is the ministry of the word? That was heavier than I thought. Well, I'm going to make an argument for expository preaching. Right? That's, after all, what we're talking about in this class, why we do what we do, why we believe in expository preaching. So what's the definition of expository preaching? This is from a book I really like, and I, we've handed out to several people. It's called Nine Marks of a Healthy Church by Mark Dever. In that book, he gives a definition. says, Expo- expositional preaching is not simply a verbal commentary on some passage of Scripture. So it's not just me walking through the text, explaining the text. No, 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 there's more to it. Rather, expositional preaching is that preaching which takes for the point of a sermon the point of a particular passage of Scripture. That's it. The preacher opens the word, unfolds it for the people of God. So I unpack, I explain. Not only do I explain its meaning, but I also explain how it applies. I make exhortation and admonishment to you in order that you might follow after the path of Christ and that you may repent of your sins. Tom uh, Tom Pennington put it like this. I would say an expository sermon is one in which the preacher reads the text, explains the text in its context, and applies the text. So, this is one form of preaching. And it's the preaching we do most typically here at Grace Church. And there's a reason for that. Um, But let me explain what expository preaching is not. Number one, expository preaching is not the only way to teach. You may notice right now, I'm not expositing a text. I'm systematically walking you through one subject, and I'm doing so from multiple different verses. And in so doing, I don't think I'm sinning. There is a time and a place for systematic teaching, for topical teaching. But is that the main diet of the church? Number two, expository preaching is not a salvation issue. If somebody goes to a church where they don't preach expositorily, doesn't mean they're not a Christian. Right? We want to speak with grace here. We want to do this with love and humility. Number three, expository preaching is not a guarantee that you will always get the Bible right. I've heard many brothers who are expository preachers where we disagree. It means one of us is wrong. Right? We can both be wrong, but we can't both be right. That's, that's kind of the that's objective truth. Objective truth has a specific meaning. One of us got it, one of us didn't. And so you can get expositional preaching wrong that being said I, I truly believe this is the most safest way to preach this is the most biblical way to preach this is the most wise and effective way to preach and that's why it's the main diet here at grace church right um that being said what i just said is somewhat controversial and so I'm going to give you, this is a well-known evangelical pastor today. I'm not going to put his name out there because I don't want to beat him up. Um, but um, here's what he says. Guys that preach verse by verse through books of the Bible, that's just cheating. It's cheating because that would be easy, first of all. That isn't how you grow people. No one in the scriptures modeled that. 
There's not one example of that. So here we have um, a gentleman who uh, claims to be an evangelical pastor saying, uh, by the way, I'm not saying he claims to be evangelical because of this statement. He's made other statements that make me think he wonder. But um, he calls it cheating. He says it's, it's not biblical and it's not beneficial. And so the question is, okay, well, I, I want to be biblical. That's, that's the whole goal of why we do what we do in the first place. We're examining our practices. We're examining our character, our patterns, in order to seek to submit ourselves to God's word. I also want to be beneficial to you. I don't want to do something that's going to hurt you or harm you or not be helpful to you. So how do I know if it's biblical and beneficial? Let's just examine those two questions, right? Number one, is it biblical? And here's where, again, um, I got this from Nine Marks of a Healthy Church's website. They, they answer the question, do we see expository preaching in the Bible, right? First, um, well, before we even get to the examples, let me just say this. Pastors are clearly commanded to preach the word. Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul's writing to Timothy toward the end of his life, toward the end of his ministry, and he's trying to admonish and encourage Timothy to go on in his ministry as a pastor. What does he say? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, but preach the word. So my job isn't just to preach my opinion. In fact, that's the height of arrogance to get up here and tell you and really hijack an hour of everybody's time and, and, and hey, listen, you have to listen to me. Who, who am I that, that I have that right? And I'm not a good enough entertainer to captivate you for that long with stories either. Which means the only right I have to come up into the church and speak the word or, and, and to preach to you is to preach something beyond myself and say, thus says the Lord. To give you what the Bible says because it's not about me. And friends, whenever you get mad at your pastor, and it's going to happen, trust me, we blow it all the time. Don't look at your pastor. Look at the Word. Listen to the Word. And through the Word, look to Jesus. We are commanded to preach the Word. Not our opinions, not our philosophies, not our priorities. And friends, this is really important because the reality is even if I just jump around and bounce from place to place and, and I kind of like use a Bible verse as kind of a, a jumping off, board, a diving board to get to what I really want to get to, there's no guarantee unless I stay with the word that I'm going to keep teaching the word and not just my opinion. Moreover, if I don't preach co uh, consecutively verse by verse, there's always a danger that I ride a hobby horse. That there's some part of the Bible that I really like and there's some part of the Bible that I really don't. So I just go with the parts that I really, really like. And boy, we can all do that. So expository preaching is commanded. It grounds the pastor. It gives authority to the pastor's ministry. And it also balances out the pastor. It forces the pastor to go deeper. Because now, as I go verse by verse, and as I explain the passage to the people, that forces me to engage with passages of Scripture that I've not necessarily thought through. So your pastor's growing. The people are growing. You're getting balance. And you're doing so from the authority of the Word. Um. I don't know, excuse me, uh, examples from the Bible. Here's examples from expository preaching, right? Number one, um, Levitical priests taught the law. So in the Old Testament, under the Old Testament law, in addition to offering sacrifices, the priests of ancient Israel were to explain God's law to the people so that they would understand and obey it. So Deuteronomy 33 says, They shall teach Jacob your rules and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. Part of the role of the clergy in the Old Testament amongst the people of Israel was to teach and preach the law, to explain and unpack the law and to apply it to the lives of the people of Israel. Number two, Ezra and the Levites give, this, give the sense of the word. During Israel's return from exile, when all the people gathered to hear the law, Ezra and all the Levites traveled among the people and explained it to them. So here's the verses. And this is really, really important because this is one of the most just picture-perfect examples of expository preaching. 
And all the people gathered as one man in the square before the water gate. So this is the people of Jerusalem, the people of Israel. They're gathering as an entire nation. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, that's the Bible, that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square, before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. And lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that people understood the reading. So not only are they reading the Bible, they're also teaching the Bible, they're explaining the Bible, they're expositing the Bible. Number three, where else do we see this? Prophets were to speak God's words, not their own thoughts. In the book of Jeremiah, God condemns false prophets for speaking their own thoughts and visions instead of the word of God. And the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceits of their own minds. That's from Jeremiah 14. A prophet's job, like a preacher's today, was to faithfully proclaim all that God had revealed and nothing else. Number four, Jesus interpreted the law and the prophets and the writings. We see this, for example, I'm teaching through right now the Sermon on the Mount in the back in the youth group. It's amazing how expositional it is. And then on the road to Emmaus, Jesus took two disciples through all three parts of the Hebrew Bible and demonstrated how the point of the entire Old Testament was him. Number five, Peter expounded the Psalms. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and expounded Joel 2, Psalm 16, and Psalm 110 as they related to the day's events and the recent crucifixion of the resurrection of Christ. True, Peter didn't expound just one passage or do so in exhaustive detail, but he did explain and apply those texts of Scripture as they related to Christ's work and his hearer's sin. Finally, Hebrews, and this has uh, been really fascinating to see the scholarship on this one. Hebrews, many uh, New Testament scholars believe, is an expositional sermon. So the book of Hebrews in your Bibles towards the end of your New Testament, and they're saying that is an expositional sermon. Uh, Much of the book is devoted to explaining parts of the Old Testament in light of the work of Christ. For example, Hebrews chapter 3 is an extended exposition of portions of Psalm 95. So do we see this in the Bible? Are there examples? Do we see it modeled for us? Yes, yes, yes. Next, is it beneficial? Now, if it's biblical, it's going to be beneficial. But let's just play it out for a second, okay? Number one, I don't know how that became B. So it's through the word that the preaching, it's through the preaching of the word that we first hear the gospel and are saved. So it's through the word that we first hear the gospel and are saved. How do I know that? Because that's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Got another story. Boy, I'm all over Mark Dever today, but li- listen to this one. He said, at a recent conversation turned to a book, or it's here, at a reception, the conversation turned to a book that had just been published. I had read it because I was about to give a speech on the topic of the book. My host, who was a Roman Catholic, had also read it for a review he was writing. I asked him what he thought. Oh, it was very good, he said, except for it was marred by that author's repeating, repeating that old Protestant error that the, Bible was cre- that the Bible created the church. When we all know, said my Roman Catholic friend, that the church created the Bible. Well, I was in a bit of a quandary. It was his gathering, and I was his guest. What should I say? I saw the whole Protestant Reformation flash before me. I decided that he, if he could politely be so openly dismissive, then I could be as forthright and honest as I wished. So I just came, out, came right out and said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Trying to be pleasantly contradictory as I could, I continued, God's people have never created God's word. From the very beginning, God's word have, has always created his people. 
from Genesis 1, where God literally creates all that is, including his people, by his word. To Genesis 12, where he calls Abraham out of Ur by a word of his promise. To Ezekiel 37, where God gives Ezekiel a vision to share with the Israelite exiles in Babylon about the great resurrection to life that would come about by God's word. To the supreme sending of God's word in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. To Romans 10, where we read that spiritual life comes to us by the word. God has always created his people by his word. It has never been the other way around. God's people have never created God's word. End quote. I thought that was brilliant. And it really does, I think, um, boil down one of the main disagreements we have with our Roman Catholic friends is which one comes first and which one has authority, the church over the word or the word over the church. We would say God has authority and therefore his word is the marching orders for his church. It shapes our church. And if it doesn't, it means our church is being shaped by something else. But think about this in your own life. When you first got saved, when you first became a Christian, it's not because you're smarter than everybody else. It's not because you're better than everybody else. It's not even because you were simply raised in a Christian home. It's because at some point, the Spirit of God worked through the Word of God to change your heart, to captivate you with an image through faith of Christ, of His beauty, of His glory, that you realize was worth giving your life to. And everything else in your life paled in comparison. Isn't that what Christianity is? It starts with the word, because God works through the word. Number two, it's through the preaching of the word that we know who God is and we love him. Again, how do you, know, how do you not know a God that you love? How do you love a God that you don't want to know? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How do you believe in him? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. So how do we love God? Through the word. How do we know God? Through the word. How do, we, how do we become Christians in the first place? Through the word. Remember, it, it also takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. Right? And this is where I think Christianity has become, especially in the West, very anemic because we pick and choose which parts of the Bible we like and we go with those parts and we don't listen to the rest of it. And in so doing, we don't have a balanced diet. It's just like eating, guys. You have your food pyramid. You're supposed to hit all those different parts. You're not supposed to leave certain parts out. And if you do, it's going to have nutritional negative effects upon you. The same is true of the Bible. The whole Bible is required to make a whole Christian. Acts chapter 20, verse 26 through 27. Paul knows he's going to see the, the church in Ephesus. This is the last time. He's talking to the elders. What does he say? Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. Why? For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. What a powerful thing to say. Old Testament, New Testament, I preached it all. 66 books, I preached it all. You know, listen, from front to back to the table of contents to the glossary to the maps, I preached it all. So if you don't believe it, that's on you. But I love you, and in my love, I have shared his word. That's, what a, pa- that's a pastor. That's a minister. It's through the word that we hear the commands of Christ. Remember what we were told? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Well, how do we do that unless we know what Christ commands? Finally, God uses his word to galvanize his people. God uses his word to galvanize his people. If you look throughout history, church history, and biblical history, you will see that the highest moments in the people of God the moments where we have done great things, the moments which have led to renewal and reformation have all come on the hooves of preaching. Don't believe me? You see it even in the Old Testament, right? The great revival under Josiah, king of Judah. And how does it start? And they taught in Judah, speaking of the Levitical priests, having the book of the law, that's the Bible, 
with them. They went about through all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. Josiah got rid of the sin, but he also sent out the priests to preach the word. And it's through the word that the people changed. It's through the word that the people repented. It's through the word that the people came and covenanted with Josiah to follow the Lord. And they did so all the days of Josiah's life. Don't miss that. And how does Josiah start off? Where, where does Josiah get changed? You guys remember? You know, we, we got that temple right there. Um, I think that's to our God, historically, to the Israelite God. But my parents didn't really go to church. And I don't really go to church, but we should probably clean it up. I'll tell you what, we'll pay to clean the temple up in Jerusalem. So he sends the priests in there. They start sweeping this bad boy out. As they do so, they find a scroll. They're like, hey, king, we, we, Josiah, we, we found this scroll it's a pretty neat scroll. Can I read this to you? He's like, sure. Well, apparently it's the law of God. Who knew? So he starts reading through this book, and as soon as he does so, Josiah's hearing this. His face drops. His countenance falls. He tears his clothes. He's like, oh my goodness. We've broken every part of that law. The wrath of God is upon us. We have been so good. He has saved us and delivered us from, from every enemy. And we have rebelled against him. So it's through the word that even Josiah is transformed. That's why he sends the Leviticus, Levitical priests out with the word. Why? Because it first hit him. And friends, my fear is, in a lot of churches today, the reason why we, we are not confident in the word of God is because it hasn't hit us first. Because we haven't wrestled with it first. Because we haven't been convicted by it recently. There may have been a time in the past, but as of recent times, we have not been just brought to our knees and shown the beauty and the brilliance of God's word in the face of Jesus Christ. And that's a heart problem with us. People sometimes, you know, pastor, you know, they, they took prayer out of the schools. Look, <laughs> they took the Bible out of the schools. And what I want to say is, look, we took the Bible out of, our, out of our lives a long time before they took it out of the schools. Like, let's, I, I, I'm all for the Bible in the schools, but hear me say this. It'll never get in the schools unless it's in your heart, and it's in your word, and it's in your mind, because it's in your hands, and it's in your family, and it's in your church. It starts here. The culture never surpasses the church in holiness. It starts with the church. And so, Grace Church, may we be a people of the word. Because we're a people of Christ. Any questions? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to point people back to Jesus and point them back to your word. And thank you so much that our faith, that we have a more perfect word, more fully confirm to which we would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Lord, that is our, that, that's our foundation. We stand on and under your word. And so, Lord, help us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.